Thank you for attending. I'll call to order our special meeting of the Brockton School Committee. Uh, our agenda today is basically to um, talk about our next steps and where we are with respect to um, contemplating an equity lawsuit regarding funding. Um, we've all been seeing the realities of what's going on with Chapter 70 money and funding and we feel that Brockton is being and other urban districts are being shortchanged. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about where we were, where we've been, where we are at, and where we may proceed, especially in light of the new funding formula. And um, we will have our special guest, Attorney Sarah Ketanyani, um, who will be uh, informing you in terms of the legalities and uh, her perspective and issues that she identifies with respect to this. But I will turn it over to the superintendent for a um, summation of where she views the situation at this point in time. Miss Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Minicello. Um, you know, thank you, uh, those of you that could be here this evening. I know that we have had responses from, we invited our city council members, uh, we invited our legislative group, and this is just a busy time of year. We have a number of people that contacted us telling us that they are on vacation, but we will continue to update the group as we go forward. I think you have to go back a year um, when we went through our budget in FY15. One of the things that became very, very clear to us is regardless of the money from the state with the foundation formula, there were things not available to us as a district with the high needs we have with special education students, our large ELL population, our large uh, number of students that live in poverty, um, our uh, Transportation. Uh, transportation, McKinney-Vento, inflation factors that certainly didn't take into account a lot of the costs that we encounter in trying to run a very large school district. So there was talk about this. If you go back a year ago to June of 2014, we actually penned a letter to the commissioner. Um, we included um, our legislative group, our counselors, all the people that were invited here today to say that we felt the funding formula wasn't fair, that we were looking for additional funding streams. There were talk at one point about something called a pothole fund, which allows a district that has unusual growth within a year to tap into this additional money. The response back from the commissioner's office was very clearly that there were not additional monies available. We had asked if there were grants that you know could have supported us. And what they did talk about was the review of the Chapter 70 funding. So what we did do was we got together last year, um, our executive team, uh, Aldo Petronio, and what we saw happening was throughout the state, a task force was put together of, I believe, Senator um, Sonia Chang Diaz, uh, Alice Peich, I think she's House of Representatives, uh, Representative Brady, is that correct? Yes along with uh, yeah, urban, yeah, urban, yeah, urban, I'm sorry? Thank you, and Rep Brady is sharing with us, and as I said throughout the meeting tonight, we know people are very busy coming from work, et cetera, so we certainly will update people as they come in, and we'll continue to have this dialogue, uh, unfortunately for us, I think, for a while to come. But one of the things that this review commission was set to do was to go over, go, go throughout the state and hear what different constituencies had to say about Chapter 70 funding. So we were very, very pleased. I think the intent was that when they came to our locale, you would give an opportunity to superintendents, you know, business managers, school committee members to have an opportunity to address this commission. But what we did, and as Brockton always does, I think we're overachievers. We wanted to make sure that our message was heard at every single one of these locations geographically. I attended one on the Cape and actually was able to submit testimonial, but I have to, again, I know I've talked to you about this a number of times, but our Chief Budget Officer, Aldo Petronio, went to every single one of them. At one point, even left on a Friday night to make sure he was in Western Mass for a very early in the morning uh, session, I think out in Amherst. So we made sure that Brockton was heard loud and clear. We talked about looking at that October 1st date when we have to submit our enrollment and how it really disadvantages us when we have over 400 kids that come in during that school year that we still have to educate. 
We certainly talked about English language learners. We did talk about the transportation McKinney Vento. We did talk about our high poverty rate. So there were a lot of things that we talked about. We talked about our health insurance. So, and we talked about it over and over again, as did superintendents from suburban areas, from urban areas, school committee representatives. So I say that because this is where we are today. On June 30th, a preliminary report has come out on the Chapter 70 Review Commission. It was actually presented to us last week. I was at a conference down the Cape with superintendents from throughout the state. The commissioner actually spoke and we heard, and I think we have copies. Uh, Aldo will come up and talk to you a little bit about it, but we will have copies for every one of you about this preliminary uh, report that has come out of uh, the commission. But here's what I am hearing. And I, I do find that as far as we go, we do not have patience and that's okay. So when I say that, one of the things that we've been asked to do is let the commission finish their work and they're looking to report out, I believe the date is November 1st, 2015. And the report out will be what they're intending to recommend to our legislative group. Aldo will come and talk to you tonight about the focus in the preliminary report is uh, around the health insurance costs and tying that into the inflation factor that we get when we receive our Chapter 70 funding and the high cost of fully funding, I believe, the circuit breaker funds. So those were the two major areas. But there are a lot of other areas when you look at this preliminary report that they talk about that they will address before the end of the report. Here's the part that makes me very worried. Although this sounded great even in the preliminary report, the thing that really concerned me was the words subject to appropriation. And I want you to remember this because we do have attorney Sarah Catignani here with us this evening and she will talk to us a little bit about the merits of this type of a lawsuit. Um, I'll also let you know that I have um, made contact with attorney Michael Weissman who was the lead attorney for the plaintiffs back when we all talk about the McDuffie case and into the Hancock case and attorney Catignani will share with you some of the concerns or the challenges that we face with a lawsuit but also when she and I have had conversation and I mentioned that subject to appropriation with the legislature that could be something that's very important to us. So uh, without going any further just to put this into perspective I hope this evening we'll share with you where we're at We'll talk to you about the merits or, or, you know, going forward with this type of a lawsuit. I do know that Michael Weissman is being invited to an urban superintendent meeting on October 2nd, and I believe he's accepted. At the urban superintendent meetings, you have, uh, I think there are 18 districts that are represented. So again, Brockton is not the only one facing this. And obviously it's important to us that if we are looking at an equity and education lawsuit that we include other districts that are facing some of the challenges like districts that we're facing. So that will happen in October and that's again previous or before that November 1st date comes out where you get your full report on the Foundation Commission. So I'd like to invite Aldo Petronio to come up and share with you some of this information and we'll talk about some of the preliminary findings. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank uh, for coming here in attendance this evening State Representative Michael Brady, um, Ward 1 Councillor Timothy Cruz, um, coming in Ward 7 Councillor Shirley Azak, Councillor at Large Shana Barnes. Uh, we also have a couple of people who I believe are running for office. We have Steve Foote running for Councillor Ward 6 and uh, Brett Gormley running for school committee ward four. So thank you all for coming and showing an interest in this issue. Um, Aldo, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I guess the superintendent kind of surmised it correctly in that this foundation review commission was to look at what all of the districts in the Commonwealth, which is a little over 300, I think, districts, what their concerns were with the formula. Now you've had the the basically the urbans against the suburbans. The suburbans saying that too much of the monies and the funds are going to the urban districts and the urban districts saying we have a much needier um, population, a much difficult, pop more difficult population to educate and therefore additional funds are needed. We have taken on that responsibility. And we explained to them that not only do we have them but 
Brockton, you know, especially, we're, we're the best at it. We are. What we need is that additional funding. We're happy to take every student that's sent our way, but we need an appropriate amount of funding to do that education process. So, and along the discussions we had, we explained to them that you have, you know, English language learners in all districts, but you have some districts that have English language learners that are coming from families that are here, you know, that are, that are highly educated. They're here because they're attending Harvard Medical School. They're here because the parents are being professors at MIT. These children come in with a, uh, a, a great uh, educational background from whatever country they may have come from, whether it's Russia, or whether it's China. And those children, although they're ELA, don't have the same needs as some of the urban districts have that have children that come here from Haiti, Cape Verde, um, you know, the Central Americas, the, the South Americas, that we need additional funding for those students. So that was primarily the focus. We asked that they look at the poverty levels of the area, the poverty levels of, of, the, of the children and their families, uh, along with the needs of, you know, the um, ancillary or the ad additional programs that are necessary. A lot of these children have seen trauma. A lot of these children are from homes where they're not stable. So there are additional um, aspects that we feel needed additional attention in the formula for more funding. So this report that they put out basically says one of the big aspects that everyone touched on was health insurance costs rise anywhere from 5 to 9 to 10, 11 percent a year. And the foundation budget goes up maybe 2 or 3 percent, if we're lucky, a year. It does not keep up with it. So what, what they proposed, which looks pretty good, is that since the Commonwealth is using the GIC plan for health insurance, is they propose that going forward, as the GIC plan health insurance costs go up, whatever that rate is, they apply that in the formula so that all communities can feel that, that increase. So if they see a 9% increase in one year, then we in our formula should see a 9% increase. The way they've carved it out in this proposal you'll read is they're saying that whatever percent of your budget is the benefits, they'll apply that 9% to. They'll apply an overall factor to the budget of whatever the, um, I forget the actual uh, stream that they use, but it's governmental services and goods statewide. That's the factor they've been using for us. Now, some of you know, technology hasn't really gone up uh, as far as what it costs to buy a computer. If anything, it's gone down. So that factor is not great for us. So in the overall factor, this past year, we saw a 1.5% increase. The year before that, we saw about a 1.3% increase. That doesn't even come near our collective bargaining agreements and our contract settlements with the unions and our health insurance costs. So the fact that they've carved health insurance out looks pretty good for us. Um, now they're looking, uh, again, in the formula, you'll see that they're in the proposal they're putting forward, they're discussing, uh, which was the number two big item that everyone talked about, was special ed costs. Everyone, every district has to spend a certain amount of money out of pocket themselves. It goes up a little each year, but we're around $38,000, $39,000. We have to pay from our funding every year before what they call the circuit breaker trips back in. So if a student costs us 200000 and yes, we have them, they cost us 200000 a year, they go to an out-of-district placement, they um, have very high needs, whether it's the, um, m there's medical issues along with a lot of times what they have, but um, everywhere from the school for the blind all the way to the, the, the children who have severe needs. If we have, to, if we have an out-of-district placement at $200,000, the first thirty-eight, thirty-nine thousand, we have to absorb, we have to pay. Everything over and above that, the way the law is written, we're supposed to be reimbursed for all of that. But they're now at about 70, 72 percent reimbursement of that. So we still burden a little more than the 38, 39,000, and the following year we get reimbursed for part of it. They're now looking at changing the formula slightly so that that initial 38, 39,000, that we can, we'll get more funding towards that amount, so we'll be a little better off. And at the same time, they want to look at expanding the overall percent return from the 71, 72 percent a little higher. So again, that we're not burdening ourselves overall. When they look at this, they look again district-wide across the state, and they see that certain levels that districts have, about 15, 17 percent of the students are in this category, and they feel that they've, they've covered it pretty well. But the, the problem is um, a lot of these out-of-district tuitions they increase at four, five, six, seven percent a year. 
and they have to apply to the state and sometimes they wait a couple of years to get their approval but they eventually get their approval our reimbursements don't go up as fast so now they're going to try and tie the two together so that we um, have a better indicator there so what's left really for, for, for Brockton in this is the payment of wages that's our biggest part of the budget that we're looking to be reimbursed on and the fact that our high needs population is not really being identified in the formula and I think that's probably the basis of what this lawsuit in the past has looked at and going forward the lawsuit in the past basically said that every child in the state deserves an equal amount of funding for their education so at the time they said it it was it worked well but since then our costs have grown much faster and much higher than the suburban districts. It's at the point now where the urban superintendents have all you know, been discussing this and saying that it's time that the state has to go back and look at how they're funding us and fund us back at a level that a child in Brockton gets the same amount of education and, and uh, assistance as the children in Holliston, as the children in uh, Lemonster, as the children in you know, Lexington. And so that's what the basis of this is all about. Again, at the same time, those suburban districts are arguing that they are looking for funding because so much goes to the urbans. But I think that this lawsuit is what um, tries to put everybody back on an, evil, e an, an equal playing field. There was a little adjustment right, to the definition of um, low income. The yeah, it's there was, a, there was a big adjustment. I just, I just pulled that out. We're concerned about Naldo. Can you talk about economically disadvantaged versus yes. low income? Yeah. Right. It's it it won't affect us as strongly in FY16 as it will in FY17. The state is looking for a, a way again of looking across the state uh, and assigning a, 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 an easier plan for determining the poverty levels across all districts. In the past it's been lunch applications. Everybody turns in the free and lunch applications and that is very thorough but very cumbersome. And we do it and Brockton's rate has gone up this past year was 83 percent of our children are free and reduced. The state is now saying that they'd like to be able to use, since that formula is used for Title I and other funding streams on allocating funds and such, they'd like to come up with a, something that's more um, less paper driven and more driven on state statistics so what they want to do now is this plan where they look at your total number of SNAP your, what they call directly certified students so we at the yes we at the beginning of each year take our student database of 17,000 plus students we download that to the state the state comes back and says we've matched for us it's about seven or eight thousand we've matched eight thousand of your kids to being on the state rolls for SNAP for welfare for Medicaid uh, homeless um, there's many different categories so we've directly certified them you don't need to get lunch applications from them we've identified them we know them you know you can move basically um, set them up in your system as directly certified note that and you don't need applications now go <coughs> on and get applications from the other 10,000 students that you have to go in and determine whether their income is such that they need to be on a, you know need to be on a free lunch plan so that figure is about 40 percent now from 40 to 41 percent with the applications we get up to 83 percent the state now is looking to push this formula to say we don't want the applications anymore we'll look at your directly certified rate and to even be more generous to you you know the the, the feds say we can put a factor on it of 1.6 when they originally proposed this it was 1.4 and they come to Brockton they came to me early on because they wanted us to get involved in it and I said it doesn't work for us that brings us into the 60 percent or so level we're at 83 percent we need a factor that brings us to 83 percent otherwise you're not looking at us um, you know, on an equal playing field with other other communities in the in the Commonwealth, so they're saying, well, if we judge you all the same way, then you'll all come down equally in your percentages. But my argument is, no, we won't. We have many families that are here that, although they're they're poor, they're working, they're still on the poverty level. They're too proud to go and get state benefits. They're 
they have that's exactly for us. gravitate to they're not going to sign up for this stuff so we're going to get clobbered exactly it's so ridiculous so and I brought that up. So at about three weeks ago at a conference, they, they, they know me well. Um, I, I jokingly said, but I was serious, I said to everyone who was there, it was an urban superintendent, I mean urban business officers meeting, but state officials were there. I said to them, so if you're going to push this down our throats, what you're basically saying is I have to go into the business of giving out state benefits. Along with signing up new students who walk in, I'm going to have a separate desk where they go to to sign up for SNAP and welfare and such. So although you might be saving yourself some money, you feel in this formula, you're going to be costing yourself ten times more, and f and families are going to be signing up. They didn't like that. They 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 made it pretty clear they didn't like that I said that, and basically that we don't have the right to go and sign people up. And I said, well, that's that's fine. I have a new $100 million complex going in one block away that is the state agency that we can direct people to. I said, because what you're going to do right now in this, just in my lunch program alone, I'm going to lose over a million dollars, okay? I said, we have equipment that's over 40 years old in our schools that we're just now getting to replace. I said, no child goes hungry in Brockton. They're all, all, every single one of them is fed. We make sure of that. I said, but now if this is going to you know, trickle into all of our other programs in the city, I said, you're going to be costing communities like Brockton millions, and I know where the savings is going to go. It's going to go into the suburban districts. It's your way of... Yes, because they're going to basically say, you're not, you're not as, as poor as you made yourself out to be. That's how they're going to portray it. So... Um, a week or so, maybe two weeks after that meeting, I got an email back that said um, that they'd like some more input and more ideas from, from communities or from school districts as to how they could look at this plan and how they could make changes to this plan. So, of course, my response back was, give me a factor of 2.0 on the directly certified rate, and then, you know, we'll be back on our, in the playing field. But their response was, the feds only allow 1.6. That's the highest factor they could, they could uh, allow. So, again, it's another, I think, reason why we have to look at this, at this suit, at least bring the state, you know, put them uh, on notice that we can't continue on the track that we're on. The recalculation of formula is being driven through the state legislature? Or is it through the governor's office? What's the, what's the pathway? Ultimately, did that change? Is that DSE or? Uh, it's DESC is the one who's developing the plan, but I think ultimately it's through the legislature. Um. Okay. So they'll make a proposal or they'll make a recommendation that'll require legislative approval at some point in time. It I is think so. DESC. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Joyce and then Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Aldo. Just a couple of things. First off, on the. Um, on the uh, English language learners, okay, that are new to the country. Uh, was there any discussion in addition to the fact that the English language learners, a lot of the children come here with serious gaps in their education? The superintendent. Okay? In addition to the poverty, yeah. a lot of them don't have, they're not up to, to speed on their, uh, some come without any formal education. I discussed it a couple of meetings with the superintendent, had a lengthy um, um, discussion and write up that she provided them with that. That you know again. That's if, another if, factor that the suburban districts they may have English language needs, but they don't have that on top of it. Exactly, exactly. These children that are coming into some of the suburban districts, like I said, their parents are very well educated, mm -hmm. and they're a lot of them are very well off. So they come here with a lot of knowledge already, and within and six months or so, education. they're already yeah. they're already caught up to speed. So. So instead of it being based on a broad. Um, designation of English language learner maybe have it more based on need in the fact that they have these other additional uh, challenges. Yes, uh, it was. I spoke about it. Springfield spoke about it. I know New Bedford, Fall River spoke about it. We all, as people got up to the microphone and spoke, the next person in line, you saw them making notes. They kept harping on the same issues, saying mm -hmm. we agree, we have the same issues. And I think it was the superintendent of Springfield who actually said to the, who gave the idea of, why don't you tie the health insurance increases to the GIC? You you want us to go into the GIC? Why not tie it into that? And mm -hmm. and they took that and put it into their proposal. So that's how it came about. Because when I got up there, I said that was of all the people I've heard speak at all the different um, events. I said that was the best one 
I think that actually hit the nail right on the head as far as how to solve one piece of, of the problem that we have. Sure. So since the state advocates the GIC and, and, and uh, is pushing it, why not tie a formula to it? So. And just one other that, question. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry go ahead, one, If you look at page 8, and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of, I'm sure you saw that part B, that is one of the items they'll look at, the English language learners. Right, but just not as a whole, but as a, um, additional needs on top of being an English language learner. Right. You know, if you are coming in as as a 10 year old student and you've only had one or two years of formal mm -hmm. education you can't be treated you can't go into a fourth grade right. class or yeah. I even asked if they could ease up on the testing requirements if you haven't been here for three years you shouldn't be subject to their scores in your tests and how your district is rated yeah that doesn't Absolutely. make any sense it doesn't you know um, again I one, threw it out. one of the things I like that they said and this can be good or bad for us but I liked the idea of them talking about looking at like districts. So you might look at a Brockton and another district that looks like Brockton mm -hmm. and has the same type of population. And they're going to look at districts that are making improvements, that their budget is sound. I'm going to be surprised to take a look at this though. Mm -hmm. So a place like Brockton can take a look at our administrative costs, look at our teaching costs, look at what we're negotiating for. You know, it'll be interesting for us to see because I think there's very little difference. Is it the support from the local community, the city support? Mm -hmm. But it will be good for us to start to compare if in fact you're showing us a district making progress or more progress than we are. Right. So that, that's a bigger yeah. picture here, yeah. but I really am looking forward to, because we have discussions when I go before the city council, there's, you know, these are good discussions for us to have as a city. We want to make sure we're looking at efficiencies and we're educating our students in a way that makes sense. Um, I can sit here having been here 38 years and it always makes sense to me, but sometimes it's good to step outside and to take a look at something that's working. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that's something to look forward to. And just one other question, as far as the special ed uh, funding, were there any discussions about in providing incentive to districts to keep children in the district as, far and as opposed to outplacements? Because Brockton does a superb job of providing in-district in services so that we're not paying the additional expenses of an out-of-district out placement. I, I think the easy way for a community is just, just to ship a kid out of the district and then have the state pay for 80 odd percent of it. But it was, it was you want to try to keep them in the district as much as right. possible. It was more of a one way discussion where they wanted to just hear from the districts their concerns. Mm -hmm. But every now and then there was a little back and forth and, and on that they said, you know, we encourage you to work and, and with other districts and put programs together, you know, so that you can keep them within but an yourselves. Encouragement is not an incentive. Exactly. That doesn't relate. That doesn't uh, translate into additional funding because you're willing to keep kids in the district. Correct. As far as I can see, the incentive is to ship the kids out of the district because they're going to pick up 80% of the tab. Correct. So I mean, it, we do it ourselves just to save ourselves, you know, money and save the trouble for. Uh, no one wants and their child to get to on do. a van and travel for an hour, mm -hmm. you know, to a school anywhere. So. Okay. Thank but, you, Aldo. Sure, Mr. Jordan. Did anybody bring up that in some of the suburban districts, um, because of who and where they are, either the city, the town itself, the individual parents, businesses, etc., could reach in their pockets and drop X amount of dollars on the table to offset any lack of cost that's coming up from the state? No one really brought that up. Uh, what people did bring up was the fact that we're competing against districts where they have a one-on-one -on -one computer to student ratio. Reason being is because the parents are able to supply them for each student. Um, where we, on our hand, don't have that, and then we do our best to try and catch up. And we're, you know, one to every four, one to every five students. You know, those are again the, some of the, the problems that we run into. There are districts that supply computers, and the parents are able to pay for the insurance in case they break them. Where again, we don't have that that luxury here. So most of what you heard at these discussions were. Um, again the, the districts who are looking for funding. You had rural district, districts out in Western Mass whose biggest complaint was getting internet and Wi-Fi out to their location because Comcast and no one else wanted to run a line out to a farm community that only had you know 12 families and they in turn their biggest concern was busing because they had buses that you know, rode over an hour to pick up students and get them to a school. So. Um, 
they in turn were asking for more funding for that, for their purposes. There weren't many suburban districts there arguing um, that they were in dire need of funds. You no, know, I only bring that up because, again, if whether it be sports or whatever it may be, they usually can can do that. They can actually come up with the funds themselves without having to go back to the state or additional fees or anything else where a city like ourselves and some of the other urban districts just don't have that ability that the, the folks within the city don't have that kind of disposable income. So. Right. The, 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 the suburban districts that were there, right now there's a minimum threshold. We receive 80% funding on, on uh, net school spending. There's a minimum of 15% that they receive. Their argument was they wanted 18%, 20% that they should have a bigger piece. Not that they needed it, they just felt that they should have a, a, a bigger piece of that. So, and when you hear about there's an extra $20 per student, extra $25 per student in the budget, that's not us. That's to those districts. That's throwing them a, f a few thousand extra dollars to make them feel as though they're getting above the minimum. So, and uh, everyone thinks, oh, we got extra money. No, we, we got our 80%, and honestly, we need 90%. We need just a greater dollar amount overall. So, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Petronio. Um, excellent. Uh, I'd like to welcome Representative Claire Cronin, who um, is in attendance this evening. And um, at this point, I would like to welcome our attorney, Sarah Catignani, from Hesse, Toomey, and Lahane, to basically give us her assessment of the issues at hand with respect to this uh, situation. Thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. And for those of you I haven't met, it's a pleasure to meet you. Sarah Catignani with Murphy Hesse, Toomey and Lahane. Um, I brought some reading material in case anyone's interested. These are the cases that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to pass them out to make it mandatory, <laughs> but if you want to pick them up later, you're welcome to have a copy and give it a read over. It'll help put you to sleep at night. But there is some interesting <laughs> stuff in here which we'll talk about. A very impressive prop. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you should have dropped it on the table. I know, real hard. I saved it for court, you know. Um, so basically what these cases are focused on is there's a provision in our Constitution, the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, that says that the legislature and the magistrates have a duty to cherish dot, 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 public schools and grammar schools in the cities and towns. Now that was written back when the Constitution was written, so it hasn't really been interpreted um, thoroughly. The first real case that dug into it is the McDuffie case, which everyone hears about. And that was in, uh, by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1993. They issued their decision. But the history of that case is a little bit interesting. It was actually first filed in 1978 and uh, under the name Webby versus Dukakis. And then it progressed over the years. It would restart, but then the legislature would act. And then it would restart again, but then the legislature would act. And this happened two or three times where the case would restart but then be thwarted by, no, well, helped by the legislature until about um, 1991 when eventually the case really got going the legislature didn't act. So in December 1992 uh, is when the single justice reported the facts up to the Supreme Judicial Court and there was oral argument and the case took off. The case was combined with another case from the western part of the state and ended up being um, a group of 16 cities and towns. They focused on four of the cities and towns as representative of the group. And those four they focused on were Brockton, Winchenden, Leicester, and Lowell. And uh, as, as you may know, the, the plaintiffs in the case were students from those districts. And they were represented by Michael Weissman, as the superintendent pointed out. And there was amicus briefs filed by a whole host of actors, including the ACLU, the Massachusetts Business Alliance, MASS, uh, the Center for Law and Education, the MTA. A lot of the suburban districts filed uh, amicus briefs. So there were both sides of the aisle uh, really got involved in the case. And essentially what the plaintiffs were seeking was a declaration that there was a constitutional duty and if there was a constitutional duty had the legislature lived up to it and so they weren't seeking monies they weren't seeking anything in specific but except that duty be put down in writing and told to the legislature to act 
And again, what important part of this earlier case is they weren't seeking to necessarily equalize education among all the students in the Commonwealth, but just to reach an adequate level of education. They were arguing that students in these districts weren't even getting the education that they needed to be cherished as the Constitution required. Uh, the court found that the constitutional duty did exist. There's some pretty interesting interpretive language about how you interpret a constitution that was written so many years ago. Uh, that duty did exist and they walked through the state's relationship to education. And eventually what they found is that the state had all but completely abdicated its responsibility to educate its children financially by putting that onus on the cities and towns to fund their education system. And um, what emerged from that is that the court found that they had failed, there was a constitutional duty and they had failed to satisfy it. And that this delegation of financial responsibility could not continue. And so at that point they looked to the comparison between these four districts and several of the suburban districts to describe the situation as bleak at that point. The, court, the cases were remanded down to the county level the court retained jurisdiction, and that's important because that's how the second case got started, and basically told the legislature to act. And eventually, three days later, the legislature passed the 1993 Ed Reform Act, which, as we all know, significantly changed the funding system. However, a lot of districts felt like this was not sufficient enough and they did wait until 1999 to again reinvigorate this effort to bring a, a second lawsuit. Uh, the plaintiffs revived McDuffie by filing a ca uh, motion in the lower court which had retained jurisdiction so the case was still alive. It changed names to Hancock because obviously the students had changed at that point. And uh, essentially what they were alleging that the foundation budget was insufficient to provide them with a sufficient education for their students. And that the school systems were continuing to suffer under largely the same system that existed when McDuffie was brought. Uh, in 2002, a superior court judge, Judge Botsford, who now sits on the SJC, and that's important because she found that there was, they were not meeting the constitutional burden, but the SJC found differently, and now she's on the SJC. Um, she was assigned to preside over discovery. She looked at the four focus districts again. They changed a little bit. It was Brockton, Lowell, Springfield, and Winchenden. They had comparison districts this time, which were Brookline, Concord, Carlisle, and Wellesley. And mm -hmm. the trial lasted Like about kind communities. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> the trial lasted um, about six months. They had 114 witnesses, 1,000 exhibits. They really sh dug Judge Botsford really dug into this issue. She issued a 318 page report that found that while there were reforms, they were not enough. They were not adequate enough to meet the needs of these communities and that there was substantial disadvantage going among the students in the Commonwealth still. Um, she made some recommendations. Basically, she asked the court to order studies. How much does it actually cost to educate a child? How much does it cost to reach this adequate level? And where's the differences? And can we, can we put a number on it so that way funding is equalized? The court, um, however, louding her report, did not adopt it. So in 2005, they issued their decision and found that the legislature was meeting its constitutional charge to cherish the schools. Uh, they, they found that while the plaintiffs had shown that they, their children were not being served, they had not shown that the defendants, meaning the state, was acting in a arbitrary, non-responsive, or irrational way so as to ignore their constitutional duty. Now that's setting the bar fairly high to show that the state just isn't acting at all. Uh, they, did, they did leave open in the decision the later challenges could be successful under different facts. Now it was pretty close to when, I mean 1993 and 2005 are a significant time lapse in between, but the trial happened earlier in that, in that period. So there wasn't a lot of time for the foundation you know, changes to take place. And essentially the takeaway from the case was that the governor and legislature have, are required to intend to create a plan to equally educate the, or equally fund the education of the students in the Commonwealth. So long as they create that plan and it is seen as sufficient, whether or not it's effective is not necessarily something that will fall within the constitutional duty according to this decision. Uh, 
And so I think if we were to look at a future case um, involving Brockton and potentially other, hopefully other, urban school districts, the bar is a little bit high for what we'd need to prove in order to be ultimately successful. Now there's obviously many motives to filing a lawsuit. You could see through the history of the case, legislature responded when towns came forward and said we need help, this, there's something wrong here. That being said, you want to make sure your case is strong on the merits. So I think we have to appreciate the bar is a little bit high, but that being said, what the superintendent was speaking about earlier with this new Chapter 70 study that's going to come out with the fine print subject to appropriation. Now there's an opportunity for the legislature to act and adopt some, all, a little of the recommendations made by the department. A failure to act on those recommendations could give an opening to a case like this because we could say they're abdicating some sort of responsibility to act. Now again the bar would be high to prove that but that would be the type of opening that would be helpful for a case like this. We would again need to get a broad group of plaintiffs. It's always better to have the last cases had buy-in throughout the state which is helpful. Not just the urban school districts but the rural school districts. Yep. Uh, and then additionally reaching out to the special interest groups like the ACLU, the MTA, things along those lines would help us broaden the effect of a, an eventual lawsuit. It is something that's going to take time. These, as many of you know, have been exposed to uh, lead uh, cases as part of your duties here. They take a while to work their way through the system. Now, how this would be framed is a declaratory judgment. So you'd file it in Superior Court. They would likely assign a single judge would assign it without a decision back to the Supreme Judicial Court who would then assign it back down to a Superior Court judge to conduct some fact-finding. And as we talked about when Judge Botsford did that, it took quite a long time, quite a few witnesses, quite a lot of expert testimony. So it is something that takes a rather large investment, it takes a rather large amount of time, but those findings and that report I think is crucial to moving the cause forward and that's what these cases produce is this assessment of where education is at the state at the time. Um, so as I said, it, it certainly is something that has merit um, given the, where we are now and what I've heard and what I've seen from the Chapter 70 funding study. I think we have to wait a little bit to see how that pans out, but it's something we should start thinking about and pulling together an interest group as the superintendent's done. And our willingness to go forward or to have this as an open discussion and invite other districts while these other issues with regard to funding are going forward, like you said, could be motivation for the legislature to act with respect to those other issues knowing that this could potentially cause a, a tension that no one really wants or uh, you know, upheaval. Um, so I think we're going in the right direction by having this dialogue and getting our ducks in order if in fact um, we need to move forward. Is there, I guess, any strategic or legal value in finding defendants that highlight, say, the, the evolution of the challenge, right? I mean, I, I find it hard to imagine that even in 93 or even in 99, that there was this vision that, you know, for example, of the level of English language learner that we have now, right. or, or the exponentially growing costs of, of special ed needs. Right, but those are changed um, circumstances. Those are, that, those that are that have like to significantly be now, changed right. circumstances, right, that probably weren't even considered that heavily at the time of the last findings and rulings. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you had an idea that the state and, the, and these communities were evolving but no concept of an earthquake happening in Haiti and 500 people showing up, right? That the need support or, or you know, the kind of growing Cape Verdean community that we've, that, that's evolved and, and the diversity of language, you know, that Absolutely. schools are having to address and things like that. So, I, don't, I mean, I guess I'm, you know, in thinking about how we frame this and seek out, you know, potential, um, you know, folks to represent, you know, I'd, I'd just be interested in whether there's some strategic value in that or whether it's just a matter of finding someone. No, I think that's, uh, that's crucial actually because the way they, they left the door open in the last case was 
not that this could never be a, a successful challenge, but that you have to show more change circumstances and more facts to support a finding against the legislature. So I think you know those those types of things are going to be crucial to say yes in 1999 maybe these you know we'd have to dig into the 318 page report to make those differentiations but I think you'd, it, you'd be correct that a lot of those things weren't existent in 1999 and that those would be the types of things that the court would be willing to hear and wanting to hear of how this has panned out over time because that's how the first case came to be is the legislature was doing their job at certain points in history and that's what the case chrono uh, shows but at one point there just was a step back from education and I think if we can show that there was another a similar step back from even just certain aspects of educating the children of the Commonwealth then that would be a good foothold for the case. Or even like a, I guess semantics but like a failure to step forward right? Yeah absolutely. Because I mean, that's really uh, you know I, I've lived I've only lived in Massachusetts for 10 years yeah. I don't always get the sense that there's this like actual backwards movement except for maybe in things like the how the formula for identifying needy children in a socioeconomic need might change or evolve but there definitely hasn't been like steps forward to acknowledge that you know serving a student with special needs or serving a student with ELL needs you know isn't the same as serving a student just with poverty you know who, who has socioeconomic needs right and then you know it's exponential when you have a student who's struggling from one or all three of those needs um, and, and that there's just been this lack of acknowledgement of like when you have a kid who maybe has you know some sort of special ed need doesn't speak English and, and is living in a hotel mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that that kid costs a lot more to, to, to teach than, than just a kid with special needs or just a kid who's you know, I, I don't know it's just it's just interesting Right, but that, that's the difference. Those are the, yeah, those are the, those, those are the issues that you, you seize upon. Back when those lawsuits were brought, our ELL population was probably in the single digits. Now yeah. it's in the 30s. Yeah. It's 30, what is it, 30 something percent, Sal, our ELL population? I mean, 30 when, when, percent, right, I mean, percent. when I came to school in Brockton, it was probably 5 percent, mm -hmm. tops. Yeah. I mean, so it, it's changed, and those are the acknowledgments that, that the realities that we need to bring to light and show that's why there needs to be attention given to these issues and that's the change in circumstances. The poverty issue, the language issue, you know, our special ed population is kind of in line, right, with other districts. I mean, we're, our sp we're actually lower. We're right, lower. so our special ed population really, well, I guess you'd have to talk about the number yeah, not the, a percentage. The, you'd have okay. to talk, not the number, but the actual Cost. disabilities within that population. What, you know, do we have a disproportion of kids that have those fifty to $200,000 annual tuitions? You know, that, that's what you'd have to, you know, look at. But, um, you know, those are the issues that need to be highlighted. And I just kind of add to what you were saying, Andy. There's also a, a dire sense of urgency when you have a child that enters the, the system uh, such as the children from Haiti they're traumatized they have serious gaps in education they're learning the language and they come to us at any given point during the, the school year mm -hmm. and we can't wait for the legislation <laughs> to adapt the, the funding for those children because we need to service them now we need to service them to a great extent right away so we can help them to catch up, we can help them to, to you know, be able to survive and to be able to be successful. We can't wait for other agencies to catch up with us. Right. You're losing um, a generation of kids. You not know. not only right, that, exactly. one of the things they talk about, you bring out a great point, is when those type of kids come, it's looking at extended learning time, summer programs, and all the things we know how to do well. And, and when services. that money has been available, we've done an excellent job, but little by little, it is eroding them, all of those services. So it's not that we don't know how to do it. We need the funding to be able exactly. to do that. Right. Right. Ozzy? That same population we're talking about is a large cultural difference which we're hitting on, but a climate difference either. Also, because you have children that are coming in from a very warm climate, to in essence a cold climate and that's a whole other shock on top of everything else so clothing all the things that we've had to add in 
to help them to, to just be normal, so to speak. Um, this is another burden that sometimes I think is not looked at. It's all part of this. So. Right. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because I see our legislative group out there tonight, Rep. Brady and Rep. Cronin, and before you leave here, I have to grab you because, and this is the, as I said, I've used the term, you know, urban districts are under assault. You know, we have had a kindergarten grant that I know was in the House budget. I think you fully funded it. I believe the Senate, it was a little bit less, and the governor just vetoed the whole thing. So before you leave here tonight, I already have to speak to you to go back to work and please address that for us. And, and I see Rep. Cronin. Yeah. We are already working on the letters and speak to the House and Chairman Dempsey. And we're going to be doing that veto. So that's already in the works. So thank you. And, you. and you're always there to support us. But these are the kind of things that it's not okay to do that to us. You know, our kindergarten sizes are large to speak. Mm -hmm. We're getting kids coming with all of the things that you talked about. It's not the little child that had preschool and all those extra type of things. You know, parents that are able to provide additional opportunities. You know, when we get sometimes those four and a half year olds that we have a lot of discussion yeah. about, it's important for us to provide that full day K so that we can make sure that they're reading by the time they're in third grade. And we struggle with being successful with that because of, again, you know, limited education, you know, certainly those kinds of supports that our kids need. So that's critical for us. We've already taken the steps to override that. No, thank you. But, but these are the kind of things that, we, that we're dealing with. Every time we turn around, I feel like, again, it's something that we do well, it's important for our kids, and, and why you would veto a kindergarten expansion grant is beyond me. So I know this is politics, but it really affects us. <laughs> I know, I know that. Oh, I, if I didn't make that clear, you know, absolutely, it was the governor that that vetoed what was put fully supported, you know, by the house. Um, I think too, before we leave and move on, and I know we're going to talk about putting a task force together and kind of next five steps. Minutes. We have five minutes. The one thing I want to say, and sometimes I have to chuckle, and uh, unfortunately I know we're on camera, but I'm going to take a chance here, is I've had discussions with. Uh, top-level people in the DESC, and it is interesting about the way they view Brockton. We take a stance, we make sure we follow through, we support our kids the best that we can, and I know that we'll continue to do that now. Um, you know, there's been some pushback about talking about an equity and education lawsuit. I'm not sure what the pushback is about. I do think the Commission needs to do their work. They've worked long and hard. We've made sure we've been represented every step of the way. We're watching these findings as they come out. Um, we're preparing, again, not only with our own attorney, um, looking at Michael Weissman. I'd love to bring him forward and give you a real historical perspective on what happened with the McDuffie case, his involvement. But we would like to, before the night is finished, come up with, I, I know, Tom, you're going to address putting together this task force. Yeah, I mean, we're going to put together a task force of uh, elected officials and uh, perhaps some people from the community to uh, brainstorm, frame the issues, um, work with our attorneys uh, so that we have real community involvement in this and um, we will uh, do so hopefully you know within I'd say between now and um, October you know um, and then we will strategize seeing what is going to actually transform with respect to the funding formula um, and that will obviously direct us uh, as to how we need to proceed. Um, I have um, a lot of faith in Sarah. Um, she has big shoes to fill with Ed Lennox, but um, she's done great with us, especially with the uh, charter school situation. Very eloquent, very um, thorough. So um, I know we're in good hands. So um, Thank you. You know, we will proceed forward, and I'll talk to um, the members of the committee and obviously our um, state delegation and city councilors in terms of involvement and who wants to be involved with our with the, the task force and uh, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like so we'll talk to the superintendent and the committee and we'll figure out uh, what the best way to put this thing t together will be but we naturally wanted to make sure that uh, the community knows um, where, where we are at mentally in terms of uh, our thoughts and um, we want us to certainly include our delegation because they've all um, been obviously supportive with all of our all of our budget concerns and uh, where we're at today. So, 
We are very fortunate. Again, we have elected officials that I can't thank you enough. It didn't matter if we were in Malden and Rep. Brady. How long did it take us to get in there those mornings? And you were always there, Rep. Cronin. We had city councilors there. And Brockton really does state their case. Um, while I had the opportunity, I see some of our uh, community members that are running for public office. I'd also like to let you know and let the school committee know that once the, I, I believe you have papers that are due by a certain date, then the signatures are certified and we pretty much have our uh, ballots set for the primary coming up in uh, September. So what I would like to tell all of you, because I've been receiving a lot of phone calls, I love being able to share the challenges that we face, the successes. Many of you have heard us do a state of the schools address. We've done facility tours. Uh, we have had dinners and luncheons, and I can't thank you enough for all your support. So for those new people running for office, once the 18th comes, I would like to set aside some dates, whether you're uh, an opportunity for the mayoral candidates, we've got candidates for school committee, city council, and I would like to put up uh, a couple of probably early evenings where I'm happy to meet with you in a group rather than all individually, giving you all an opportunity to ask questions about the challenges uh, and the successes that, that we face as a district. Great. Great. Okay. Anything else? Any other issues? Mr. Representative Brady. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I want to say thank you to Superintendent Smith and the, all of the school committee members and all of our uh, education officials all across the board. Brockton is looked upon very well across the board, a lot of good, but we do always hear the debate said, well, why is all the money coming to Brockton? It should be more effort and we're debating and fighting to get the money all the time for the city of Brockton. Thanks a lot. We have a great uh,
as good as we are. It, it's a don't difficult get problem. Don't, don't get, get Councilor Azak. I am not know. It's Councilor Azak there. But, uh, <coughs> you know, we've got a great team here. We've got to continue to work together because, you know, divided, we're not going to go anywhere. And uh, I want to thank you for all your help. And I thank Councilor Azak also. And I want to recognize her. She, she did a great job supplying a lot of, um, of uh, flowers for our, uh, uh, our funeral for Thomas Kennedy who passed and, and she was very helpful to us. So thank you again and please keep in contact because we've got to work together to uh, stop the pushback in the corner office. Thank you. Agreed. Um, any further questions from the board? Seeing none, how about a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Ask everyone to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance is to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could I ask everyone to please remain standing for a moment? Uh, this is our first formal school committee meeting since the passing of Senator Tom Kennedy. And I'd just like to ask everyone to please uh, observe a moment of silence in the Senator's memory. which is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, address the school committee, the superintendent, and the mayor for up to three minutes. Uh, in order to uh, speak at hearing of visitors, uh, you have to sign up prior to the start of the meeting, and we did not have anyone sign up tonight, so there are no visitors that uh, requested to be heard in front of the committee tonight. So that being the case, we will go uh, right on to tonight's agenda. Uh, we open with a consent agenda of four items. The consent agenda is a, a mechanism in which the school committee uh, deals with routine pieces of business as a block uh, to expedite the moving of the meeting along. However, uh, before taking action on a consent agenda, any uh, member of the school committee uh, may request that an individual item be res removed from the consent agenda for individual discussion and consideration. So at this time, I'll ask if there are any members of the committee that would like to remove any of the individual items from the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as it stands. Second. Okay, motion has been made and properly seconded to accept the consent agenda in its entirety. All in favor? Opposed? Approved unanimously. Uh, at this point, I will turn the meeting over to Superintendent Smith. Uh, for the superintendent's report on learning and teaching. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I do want to mention, uh, when you talk about Senator Tom Kennedy, uh, sadly or interesting, the last time I was with the senator, he came to the uh, John F. Kennedy Day at the Kennedy School. I think it was something that he never really missed. And listening to him that day, he was very positive about the work that we're doing. He talked about us as a district, he talked about the kids, the involvement with the families. Um, so that is truly my last memory of Senator Kennedy supporting children, being out there, you know, caring what was happening in our community, and he very much did that for many, many years. So I want to express that to his family. We were so grateful, you know, for what he was able to do for us. He was always available to me as a superintendent and previous to that my many years in the Brockton Public Schools. And I just had uh, City Councilor Tim Cruz, uh, who was a family member of Senator Kennedy. And I don't know if, if many of you know this, but when they had the funeral procession uh, from Russell Peak, a funeral home, it was right near the Iron School, which is where we have our extended day children there for the summer, close to 400 of them. And on that day, although we have some kids up at the high school doing their activities, our younger kids were back at the school uh, we borrowed the flags from the Huntington School, from our Huntington School Parade, and were able to outfit every youngster. We talked about ahead of time what it meant to be a senator. Um, they lined the street there as the funeral procession went by. And it was really, really interesting. And, and we talked to the kids ahead of time. Obviously, you needed to prepare young children 
for what this was all about and who the person was. And I know you were in the procession, Mayor Carpenter. They were very impressed when you went by. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to somebody they knew. Well, but they you, you will love that they wanted to know if President Obama was coming. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were very impressed. They wanted to know if Senator Kennedy lived in a big house and was he a rich man. And, you know, I love that conversation with kids. I love being able to tell the kids that he lived really across the street, that that's the house that he grew up in. Um, you know, it was, there were questions about, they could see people going by in the procession and people were crying. They were taking actually video of the kids and the kids were responding to that. So very, very heartfelt messages from our kids. I was just so impressed with what they did and it was really heartwarming to just hear Tim say that the family continues to talk about that and the children in the Brockton Public School played an important role there. So thank you for mentioning. Um, I want to mention a, a couple of things. I'm going to start on uh, a couple of positive notes. You did get in your packet last week. Uh, we have uh, named our department head for our bilingual uh, 9 to 12 at Brockton High School, Christina DeNovis. I'm very, very pleased uh, to, to mention that at this meeting and to also tell you, I think it is important for us to note that Christina has been in the district since 1999 working at Brockton High. She is a former administrative intern and these are the kind of things that we do well. We had a number of very, very qualified candidates and in many districts they're struggling to find those uh, positions and that's uh, because of the retirement of Anna Carrera who gave us many, many years in the district. So we're very, very pleased again that we have such a qualified candidate going forward and I'm sure she'll do an excellent job. I don't think Christina is here this evening, but again, I do want to congratulate her and welcome her to the administrative team at Brockton High School. Um, also tonight, we have uh, a couple of principals that are leaving and with all of the craziness going on at the end of school, we really weren't prepared uh, with our very last meeting. We were dealing with budget issues to really talk about uh, the, our principals in the Brockton Public Schools who are leaving us. So first this evening, and I did have conversation with Helen Verga. I don't see her out there this evening, and I chuckled a little bit. Helen does not want accolades, and she told me she just did her job. She loved coming to school every day. She loved serving the families and the children in Brockton. But I had to laugh because Helen is usually at every one of yeah. these meetings. <laughs> so I did tell her that I was going to speak about her. Um, I remember Helen having been a school adjustment counselor and a former special education teacher coming into the district. I believe she came from Boston. It was a real find for the Brockton Public Schools. At the time she did assistive technology, got involved in many aspects of special education. I believe she eventually became um, uh, an assistant principal at the old, so-called the old Howard School. And she was very pleased in 2010 when you named her a principal of our <coughs> new uh, Gilmore School at the time. Uh, so again, I, I want to wish Helen well. Uh, she told me that she is going to be available for the transition uh, with Lourdes Santiago coming on as the principal of the Gilmore School. Um, I, I can't thank Helen enough for everything again that she has done for the children, the families, very much a part of the family in the Brockton Public Schools. So thank you to Helen Verga. I hope you all get an opportunity to see her along the way and express that. Mr. Smith, uh, just one quick note about Mrs. Verga. When I first came on the school committee, um, she invited me to come in and visit her. And at the time, um, her program was not over at the Gilmore, it was over at the Howard. And um, uh, you know, she was very um, cheerful, upbeat. Um, you could tell that she had a true passion for special needs children. And um, you know, she explained to me the different issues that some of the children have, and she um, just the way she described the kids. And um, we're going to miss her, and I wish her well in her retirement. But um, she was a very she is a very caring person, um, and uh, she was very generous with her time and very kind to me and was open to educate me on the, the issues that surround that type of a program. So. Helen was not quiet about educating many of us on the issues <laughs> oh, yeah. of the, her children at the Gilmore School. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Although my quick comments, so uh, my uh, grandson uh, attended the Gilmore School while I was serving on the school committee and uh, Principal Verga never missed an opportunity to lobby for some issue <laughs> that she was interested in whenever I was visiting at the school. So um, 
she was just tremendously committed to her kids and uh, uh, you know, just uh, exceptionally talented and good at what she did, but just uh, exceptionally committed to uh, to her kids in that school. And uh, I think it's uh, going to leave a void that's going to be very difficult to fill. I'm sorry, Alicia. Um, I'd love to thank Helen as well. I've known Helen since I was about eight years old when my sister went to the Downey and uh, I met her then and her commitment to technology, to the students of this community is unparamount and I really think that we're losing a gem in the community by having her retire but she's well deserved. She worked her to the last day and you know she definitely deserves a retirement and enjoy her life, but she definitely will be missed, and I have to personally thank her for all that she's done for us and our family as well. Okay, so I'll move on to our next principal. So this came to us a little bit late. Uh, we did offer the early retirement incentive, and, and I say this because the next person I <coughs> want to introduce to you is Mark St. Louis, affectionately, affectionately known as Saint. And Mark truly is a saint, and, and we have to tell you when we make those kinds of offers and we know what early retirement is, we know that these kind of things happen. You know, when we look at somebody, Mark has been committed to the district, um, I think he was a career changer and came to us in 1996, he's been here almost 20 years. Um, Mark took on anything to do with alternative schools, so you're still talking special education, you're talking the opposite end of the spectrum, not the little three and four year olds. But Mark was a master at those kids that had serious struggles in the schools, and he made sure they had opportunity after opportunity. They had opportunity to graduate, opportunity to succeed, to take a look at the behaviors that were getting in the way of their being successful, because that's what we do in the Brockton Public Schools. So Mark and I uh, had a conversation the other day. Um, I think he's still struggling. I'm going to let him share with you some of his thoughts. I love the idea. I was actually out shopping the other night and I saw one of his staff members and if you look up there, his staff members are here. So that goes to show you that the loss we are all going to feel in the district, but I think we've made it clear to Mark that we're going to certainly be able to hopefully use him with some transition. Uh, we're looking to take a different look at our alternative schools. There's a lot of changes going on and we hope to be able to continue to use his expertise he will be a friend of the district. Um, I also want to wish him well in his retirement, but it truly is a huge loss to the Brockton Public Schools. Mark, I know you don't want to do this, but I'd love you. You are here. Can you come down and please say a few words? <laughs> or, I mean, you've been here 19 years, so I, I'm sure you have some things to say. <laughs> Here's your chance. Wow. Yeah, oh boy. <laughs> I like Adam. Can you sit so we can hear you on the mic? Okay. <laughs> I like recognition, and I appreciate uh, this night. I appreciate my staff being here. <clears throat> I didn't bring Kleenex, so I might lose it at any minute. One to have the um, <laughs> one, one is good for everything. I like school. That's all I can say. I, I, I came to school. I always liked it even as a five-year-old kid. I still like it now. My kids like school, and I'm going to miss it, in all honesty. But um, my retirement is based on, uh, I feel like I, I did accomplish something, and uh, I want to continue contributing, and I figure I'll go now while I'm healthy and happy and have that feeling of accomplishment. So I, I appreciate that you're going to allow me to contribute. I'm looking forward to that. And you guys can call me anytime for me. But I gotta acknowledge my staff, they're the experts. And you know, Sue and Nan have been here longer than me. But I've been here for nineteen years. Uh, they taught me the ropes. I allowed them to do their job. And I figured as long as we did our job we didn't bother you or any other superintendent. <laughs> I don't think the mayor was ever bothered by it. Um, but that, we all worked hard to keep the kids uh, respectfully in their place. Uh, they they uh, 
responded well because I think we respected them. No matter what they did, and we had some tough guys, they could respond to redirection. And I think they, they, they felt the love. So. That's it. I don't have much else to say unless you call me up for an opinion somewhere down the I will do that. You and I have had lots of discussions, and I have to say, in my short time as superintendent, although it feels like it's been years, um, I enjoyed going, and you know that, I loved coming to the Keith Center. I especially enjoyed the B.B. Russell students. Um, I enjoyed the conversations. I knew what the struggles were. I know what your staff does each and every day. So again, we, we can't thank you enough. Um, I know you're not going far, uh, and we will continue to use your expertise in ways that we have done with so many retirees. We had a discussion today about what they contribute to our district, many times serving roles as interventionists, uh, making sure that they're supporting when a principal is out or transition or, or so many things. So very rarely, I think, do we actually lose people. So again, I want to thank you. I think I heard you mention your family. Is your family here this evening? Yeah, Noel, Christopher, and my wife, Lynn. Very well, lucky. I'm very thank lucky. you for sharing him with us for many years, and uh, hopefully he gets some time to spend with you and, and, and enjoy the beginning of his retirement. Oh, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> so, too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, right. thank thank you, you very much. much. some serious business now. Um, I do want to update you on a couple of things. Um, we do have a coordinated program review and, and as I said you always keep hearing me say and I say this to the executive team, what can happen next? You know whether it's all of the reviews we've gone through, um, it, it just continues to happen and I guess that's part of being a district and certainly a large district. But our coordinated program review will go on during the 2015 school year. I know Dr. Tarasi is involved, our special education department, Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry is, is pretty much heading this up. They'll look at civil rights and other requirements. They look at special education. They look at our English language learners. They're looking at our career, vocational, and technical education. Uh, we have Ellen Cully up at the high school, and we've invited Donna Burrell, who retired a couple of years ago, to, to come and support us. That was kind of an extra. I don't think we were prepared in the time that we would be looking at college and career. So again, um, all of these things are good for the district because it lets us see what the recommendations are, what are the things that we need to improve on, um, and, and those are the things that, that we do well. So again, uh, we'll be taking part in that this coming fall. Um, the other thing that happened this past week, and I attended along with, and I can't thank enough uh, members of my executive team. So I went to the conference on the Cape run by the Mass Association for School Superintendents uh, this past Tuesday through Friday. And when I tell you that this conference is probably one of the best conferences I attend, uh, this is my third time attending. And this year, I always feel like we're way ahead of the game. This was all about, they called it serving uh, all children and leading healthy schools. It was all about the trauma, it was all about supporting students, social, emotional needs, all of those wraparound services. Uh, and again, Brockton is way ahead of the game. So it was interesting to attend the conference with that being the focus. Um, I want to thank Deputy Superintendent Barry that came down, Deputy Superintendent uh, Thomas, uh, Executive Director June Saba. I know Dr. Murray came down uh, with Ethan Cancel and were able to take a look at aspiring superintendents. I hope that doesn't mean you're leaving us yet. But it was uh, a conference where we were certainly well represented and uh, brought back quite a bit of information. I will tell you that the mayor and I had a, a lengthy conversation today because one of the things that we do really well as a district, we do a lot of networking. And networking means, and, and I'm not going to talk about the socialization piece, although that can be fun. But the other part of that is we're talking to other districts. We developed a relationship with Springfield Public Schools, which has been a level four district, a lot of turnaround schools, extended learning time, and we have made a plan for in the fall to go and spend a couple of days in Springfield, and they would like to come to Brockton to look at some of our best practices. Those are good things for the district. I spent a lot of time while I was there talking to other districts, especially larger districts, looking at the role of a communications director. 
that is a role that we are going to be filling in the Brockton Public Schools. I want to look at it through a different lens. Uh, I think previously we had everything but the, the kitchen sink thrown in there. And I need to take a look at us as a district, not only looking at the web and how we support our schools, but also to look at the marketing, the strategic plan, the development piece, obviously the dealing, and when I say the dealing with the media, social, I mean, the, the things that are happening so fast and furious, social media, you know, it, it's, it's a changed ball game and a changed landscape. So I spent quite a bit of time networking and talking to larger districts about what they do in their district offices. I've also spent time talking to a couple of the colleges as far as their communications offices which brings us to the point I hope to have um, a job description which I will share with you and we will be advertising uh, in the globe and hope to cast a wide net to, to look at that position. The other thing the mayor and I talked about today was Deputy Superintendent Thomas when he was there. You know, I could see him talking to the MSBA. He has very good relationships with them. We continue to talk about, and as part of the strategic plan, our facility master plan. And I know the mayor and I are both on the same page. Uh, obviously, when we're struggling with difficult budgets, um, it, it, and it is something on, I want to say, on our front burner. And hopefully, again, it is something that when you talk about the needs of our district, a facility master plan isn't just about building a building. It's about the configuration of a school district. It involves the community in planning and looking demographically a number of years ahead. You know, we talked about and we're getting excited about looking at all of these high schools being built. I'm not sure we'll ever have a footprint as good as where we have right now, but we probably will have an opportunity to look at adding on to a Brockton High School, a STEM wing, a technology wing, and then the possibility of doing when you get involved with the MSBA. And Brockton is positioned very well to get, you know, additional dollars, certainly, not only our contribution, but additional dollars from the state. So I want you to hear that that's what goes on during the conference. You know, we're networking, we're talking, we're working, we're looking at best practices. So again, I, I think people think that these are just social events. I guarantee you that we were hard at work last week. So, any questions, Mr. Minicello? Oh, I'm, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that I would like to let you know that we are working with the BEA. We met yesterday. We have, oh, Kim is up there, I don't know, 96 involuntary transfers. I'm not sure Dr. Moran has been working all day. Do you have the number? 93 involuntary transfers. So um, we're at a point now where we're starting to place people in jobs. We've worked very closely, and I want to thank the BEA this summer. We've looked at reconfiguration of jobs. We've looked at ways during a difficult budget to make sure that we're resourcing the district the best we can and that we have our teachers in positions where they are able to serve our large population. So this has been going on, you know, certainly even before we finished with the budget. So we've been working all summer. We're moving forward with, again, placing people and looking where our holes are. Unfortunately, the one thing I will tell you that is a concern to me is uh, we do have teachers that <clears throat> still remain laid off, close to 60 teachers, and what I don't like is we are losing. It's good for the teachers that are finding jobs in other districts. And I'm going to tell you, our teachers are highly sought after. They're looked at very well across other districts. If they're teachers coming from the Brockton Public Schools, we've hired well, we've done professional development well, and unfortunately, I really hate to lose these teachers, but this is what happens you know, during a difficult budget. So we're doing the very best we can to get teachers back in classrooms, to get school up and going, and I know our HR office is hot at work, and I'll continue to update you on that. It does bring me to another conversation that I would like to have with you. I know we're getting very, very close to doing certainly my evaluation and to also look forward to next year. So one of the things I want to recommend when we get through this process is we normally had had our retreats during the month of August. I want to schedule our retreat for some time in September this year because one of the things I think that is important, and I'm hearing it from executive team members, I've had conversations with a number of you, that we need to look at not next year during April, May, and June when we're finally getting figures on a budget. But one of the things I would like to do is talk to you about what you see the budget priorities. Because we have spent the past two years 
trying to bring teachers back. We know what we've done to programs. But I do think we need to, and when I talk about budget priorities, I think it's September. We need to start to talk about when you have a $220 million budget, there are some things that we need to be paying attention to. And while I talk about a facility master plan, I think we need to pay attention to a curriculum plan. If we're continually taking money out of the budget every year, we're not replacing textbooks. If we're talking about taking money out of technology, we're not looking at those one-to-one -one devices. We're not putting our district or our teachers with the resources that they need to teach our children. So whether it's $500,000 that we decide for the next five years, this is going to be a priority, and we come to you with a plan for what we're going to do for curriculum for years one, two, three, four, and five. And then you continue to, to take a look at that same kind of plan for the district. We're at this point not going into a school year with virtually no money for curriculum or hoping a grant comes through. So that's something that I'd like to sit with you and find out in September what our priorities are. Again, it, it's not that things don't change for us, but that would certainly be one of our retreat items that I think would be high on the agenda. Uh, the other thing that I want to submit to is when we're looking at the ed evaluation, and, and again, it's been different with the superintendent evaluation, you know, all of us are, are still struggling with this. I think year two we're feeling very good about it. Our teachers will all be on baseline edge starting in September. And we feel that we're certainly positioned as a district to, to move forward with that. But I want to talk to you again about a timeline you know, for the superintendent where we actually have a date set where we do the superintendent goals based on our strategic plan and where we're at on our plan right now. To also look at a time in January like every other teacher where the superintendent does the mid-cycle review and that's the date that we stick to and a summative evaluation happening right at the end of school when we get through our budget. So those are some things that, again, I'd like to talk to you about if we can come up with a date. I know Mr. Minicello has been talking to me uh, about a date, and I certainly talked to the mayor today about the superintendent evaluation. Hopefully we can come up with a date before we leave here, before the August 18th meeting, and then to look at a September retreat date. Yeah, I mean, why don't we use, we'll, I'll see when everyone's available with respect to vacations for August, but since we, it sounds reasonable to bump the retreat, but maybe we can fill that time up with the superintendent evaluation and get that done. In August. In August, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, again, I, I brought up the strategic plan. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry is on vacation. I'm very pleased with, again, what I'm seeing with all of the different goal owners. We had a discussion today during our executive team. So we would like to, one of the things we talked about with the strategic plan was we had talked about a document not collecting dust, but being able to share with the district, making sure district-wide, not only our school committee, our teachers, that's certainly, we talked about that for our opening day exercise, making sure everybody knows where we're at on our strategic plan uh, and how we're moving forward for this year and setting our goals as a district, which also would be part of uh, our retreat, you know, come September. So that's something we continue to work on this summer. We're very, very busy. Um, I don't think we have downtime in the summer. It seems like we're busier. So that is my report. Okay. So we'll move on to unfinished business. Uh, any members of the committee want to put something on the table on, on, on under oh. unfinished business? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, new business in consideration of the 2015-2016 school year calendar. Uh, this calendar has been on a previous agenda uh, for discussion and uh, tonight I believe we're looking for action to adopt the calendar superintendent, is that yeah, right? Please. So uh, we're looking for uh, an approval of the upcoming school year calendar by the school committee tonight. Um, either entertain a motion then have yeah, discussion motion. or have discussion. Motion to approve the calendar as submitted with the amendment that was added. Okay. So motion to approve the 2015-2016 calendar as amended uh, is on the table. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? 
approved unanimously. Thank you. And, and I want to bring to everybody's attention that one of the things we talked about this year was we added additional dates. And some of those dates, again, we struggle to find common planning time with our elementary teachers. We have added some additional days in there for our teachers to have time within service so that they do have <coughs> that common planning time. There also will be time uh, for our teachers to continue to use those half in service days to do many of the things that we've done district wide. But we have added some additional days, I believe, uh, across all levels. So that's, that's a, a change in previous years. Unfortunately, last year, weather wreaked havoc on a number of our additional in-service days that we had planned. Uh, hopefully, we'll get through this, this season a little bit differently. Yeah. We didn't schedule any snowstorms. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Please. We're still paying for last year's snowstorms. Uh, the, the other thing, can I enter new business? I'm sorry. I, we talked about the kindergarten grant. And I do have Dr. Julianne Andrade here. I would like her to share with you. You heard our legislative delegation talk to us about already being on it. You know, the House is ready to move forward uh, with, you know, the governor's veto, you know, trying for an override. But I would like uh, Dr. Julianne Andrade to share with you what it means to an urban district and what we do with those funding uh, sources that right now it's in jeopardy for our district. Good evening. So Dr. Andrade has actually been handling and managing this kindergarten grant for five years, so there's nobody who can speak better to the real significant impact these cuts are going to have on our kindergarten students. So I thank her for coming last minute tonight. Thank you, Jude. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you tonight. So along with my position of coordinator of elementary literacy and social studies, uh, shortly after Barbara Lee retired, who was our early childhood coordinator, I took over the um, full day kindergarten grant for the city of Brockton. Uh, when we started five years ago, we had approximately 900 children. At the end of this school year, we have 1,446, approximately. And we have 73 kindergarten teachers right now. Some are um, multi-age teachers that have kindergarten, maybe a first grade with them as well, but uh, 73 at the current time. We have received cuts over the years. When Barbara Lee was here, it was as high as $700,000. So what's happened is we've had a big growth in our student population, but also our grant has decreased over time. Uh, right now, we had, at the beginning of 2014, $605,000 in our grant. Most of that money goes to pay for paraprofessionals in their salaries. Not all of them, but about 16 of them. So we do have full-time paraprofessionals in every classroom. That totals right now for 16 paras and their health insurance about $475,000 out of the grant. When the 9C cuts came in through the governor's office, we had to return, and thank goodness we hadn't spent it at that time, $137,000. And I know that going to the other kindergarten networking uh, meetings that we had, some districts offered to back to the, to the um, governor is that they couldn't run their kindergarten programs anymore with the loss of that money. And some people had already, some school districts had already spent that money and had to take it back out of their own budgets to give back to the state, which is just for early childhood, just devastating for some school districts. So we were able to at least pay for 13 paras. I met with, with Aldo, and the city or the school department picked up three paras. So we were able to keep the 16 that we paid. Uh, we didn't have to lay off any paras per se. Um, so when it went to, when the governor's budget started, it was proposed to have, I believe, last year was $23 million, but the House and the Senate now are 17. So we would receive a cut anyways. Uh, but if it's not funded at all, you can imagine the devastation that we have. There are certain things that I have to pay out of it. We've brought through uh, two schools through NAEYC accreditation, which is a real feather in our cap. That's the Arnone School and the Angelo School. So through the grant, I was able to support that process, and also we pay uh, renewal fees every year for that. We wouldn't be able to support that any longer. 
uh, the kindergarten showcases, the kindergarten registration backpacks, any materials for there. When we opened up the Barrett Russell School, a lot of that grant funding came from the kindergarten grant as we tried to outfit the school right there for materials. Um, it's been a long-standing grant in our district <coughs> and has really helped us to move forward and there are many school districts that don't have full-time paraprofessionals and Brockton does. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about it. Um, you know, I'm very concerned. I know that um, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Barry, Mrs. Saber have been, you know, kept up to date on this right now. And I believe that they did. Did the legislature override it today? They put uh, Representative Cronin came yeah. up and mentioned it's, that they mentioned put that. something together. Right. And she would update me tomorrow as to yeah. what was happening. So if that's the case, I would expect if it goes through at 17 million, we would have some type of cut. I can't tell you what it is right now. Um, I would have to wait for the, the department to let us know. So when you hear us talk about, you know, this is what's happening to, to mm -hmm. urban education, right. you know, I, I think I stated it pretty clearly about what it does to kids in our district. Mm -hmm. This isn't an extra. This, this, this is something that is clearly needed for you know, and again, our class sizes are large, even at our kindergarten levels. Yes. They're certainly larger than Absolutely. any of our counterparts. Yep. Which yep. is why, when you talk about mm -hmm. the paraprofessionals, right. talk about a critical role there. The right. size, the class sizes are what, 23 to 25? Right. The highest classroom we had this year was 26. Oh, yeah. I was, I was speaking with a Walpole first grade teacher yesterday in my office, and. Um, she says the most that they have in first grade is 21. So mm -hmm. ideally it's in the teens, you know. She says she likes to have 18, 19. But she says the most they have is 21 first graders. Right, right. I mean, that's a problem I'd like to have. Right, absolutely. And we have, you know, being an urban district, we know we have children that have um, many needs, many special needs. And um, the ratio, I believe, to teacher to student is very important. Well, just keep us apprised, please, of Absolutely. any developments. Uh, as the yeah. superintendent said, Representative Cronin on the way out said to me that they have sent legislation up to be override the veto, and she'll right. keep us informed as to where yeah. they're at with that. But yeah. um, I think it's good that our delegation was here, Mike, mm -hmm. you know, um, Representative Brady and Representative Cronin, because they hear firsthand, yeah. you know, what mm -hmm. the issues are in in an urban district, uh, district like Brockton, so they immediately, you know, jump to our defense when things yeah. like this come up, right. um, and they've always shown great support for, mm -hmm. you know, our school system and right. the issues that we uh, confront daily. So. Right. And I will say, being at the networks that I've attended for the kindergarten um, grant, it's not very popular, this decision that was made, because of the cuts were so deep. And, and devastating to many school districts. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrad. Um, I also want to let you know that we did hear uh, our Title I allocation came in. It was a 7% increase. We had hoped for more, of course. Um, we're, we're pleased with it being an increase. We're presently, uh, Karen McCarthy uh, is coming in this week and putting together the final grant to submit. But we're looking again at um, our literacy coaches. We worked with our, again, our union on that. We're looking at blended learning coming in, looking at some of the best practices around the state in Title I. Um, we're looking at interventionists, Title I teachers. So there's a real mix as to what we're doing, and we're very strategic as far as how those funds are going to be used. You know, you heard um, Mr. Petronio talk to you tonight about the economically disadvantaged, that's the new term, versus low income. This also has an effect on those Title I dollars. So there are clear mandates. It's another program that will have a review. We've got to be very, very careful about those dollars and how we use them. And though it could have an effect on what is a Title I school and what isn't a Title I school in our district based on what is economically disadvantaged. So I'll continue to update you on that. As I said, the good news is it was an increase. The bad news is I think we're hoping for a little more. And I also want to let you know uh, as an update on our situation with the email threats that we received in the district during the month of March into April and really wreaked havoc on our district. 
Uh, last week we received phone calls while we were away uh, at the conference and we were there with the superintendent from Whitman, Whitman Hanson, uh, Ruth uh, Gilbert uh, Whitner, and the FBI is involved. Uh, Ruth, uh, the superintendent from Whitman, has gone to Tennessee, as has Sharon Wolder. So they will, uh, I'm not sure, we, we weren't sure if they were being deposed. I know they were testifying in some form as to what happened. They're looking to us for the cost, what was the cost to our district of this. Um, so we will sit down and we're going to try to quantify what that meant. You will remember that we had teachers sent home, students sent home uh, during that day. I believe it was in uh, end of March, early April, early April. It was, it was April. Uh, so again, this was something that we really struggled with uh, you know, during that time. We're very, very pleased with the work that our police did, uh, FBI, um, and hopefully there will be some lessons learned with this, but I think it's amazing how quickly they have worked, and as I said, Sharon is out there now. Okay. Um, also on a new business, I uh, just want to remind everyone, invite everyone that Thursday night at 6 o'clock will be the Edison Academy graduation ceremony. Uh, right next door in the uh, auditorium and uh, I had a chance to participate in that last year. Uh, it's, it's a great graduation and if you have an opportunity uh, you'll meet some really uh, special students and teachers and uh, it, it's a great event. I think we're really proud of the way the uh, Edison Academy program is growing each year and uh, absolutely addressing uh, a part of our student population that uh, we may have been losing before, but we're not losing them anymore. So um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really a great experience. And uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas was there last year also. So uh, Thursday night, 6 o'clock in, uh, in the larger auditorium. Hope that uh, you'll be able to join us. Okay. Anything else on a new business? Well, hearing nothing else, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion made and properly seconded. All in favor. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.